Hello and welcome back to this series ranking through each era of the show and today we'll be ranking all of Patrick Troughton's stories. Now Patrick Troughton's era is a, is a very solid era for me, particularly seasons four and five. Season six veers off in quality and there's a lot of top-notch stories in this era so there'll be a lot more in this top column here than there was in the William Hartnell video which you can see on the channel. I'm hoping to go through all the doctors from the first to the 13th, excluding Paul McGann. Um, the six columns, absolute classic, great, good, okay, bad, and terrible. And they're all fairly self-explanatory. So I'll just kick things off with The Power of the Daleks, which, okay, start with your unpopular opinion, is a little bit overrated in my opinion. It's good because the plot's good, but I don't like Patrick Troughton yet in the role. He doesn't he feels so off-putting in this episode that it really puts me off the whole thing. Well, not the whole thing, because I think the actual plot of the Daleks, they're very cunning. David Whitaker is the best Dalek writer for me. Um, he absolutely understands how to write them. They are cunning and menacing and always like, several steps ahead of their opposition. And I suppose if you're only familiar with New Who, then the closest story is Victory to the Daleks, with these Daleks who are um, playing good, I suppose, pretending to be nice little servants. And then they have a huge scale plan and all that's good but the show doesn't really deal with the first regeneration very well and patrick troughton is quite off-putting he just sort of sits silently playing his uh, recorder for most of the six parts so he's actually it rarely would i say patrick troughton is the detractor from a story but just the way that this post-regeneration story plays out i know it wasn't a regeneration story at the time because they hadn't even come up with regeneration they just said that the TARDIS changed his face to keep the show going but yeah I'm, I don't know the Highlanders Patrick Troughton it doesn't restart very well in my opinion okay no bad and um, I, I mentioned in my last video that for me every pure historical after the Romans suffers from being after the Romans because the Romans is such a masterpiece and the Highlanders is definitely not an exception to this. It's got the whole slave traders plot the same as the Romans, but it just feels dull and bland. And not having any visuals to go with an historical story can really drag it down because historical stories are all about the visuals. They're about costumes, they're about setting, they're about, you know, the spectacle, but there is none of that. And the stories themselves are often quite by the numbers. So without the visual medium, this does turn out to be very bad numbers. Polly's very good in this one. Um, her and this other girl entrapping the soldier, that's great. Uh, Jamie's uh, in introduced and that's brilliant. But again, Patrick Triton doesn't really know what he's doing with the role yet. And so he just plays um, all, all these different characters who the Doctor is supposedly impersonating. It feels like he hasn't quite got a handle on the, the role yet, wh which he will have um, by s sort of the Underwater Menace, but definitely by the Moon Base. The Underwater Menace, though, is bad. I mean, it's. I wouldn't put it in terrible because it's at least fun enough, and the villain is so beautifully over the top. And I actually like the fish people quite a bit, but the plot is so stupid. Like, why do you want to blow up the world? Why? Um, it's all right, but it's just. I think it also shows that they don't really know what to do with Ben now. They've got Jamie. They've just got another male companion who just they don't really know what to do with. The settings are cool. Uh, I really enjoy the set design and all that stuff, but no, this era doesn't start on a particularly great note. The Moon Base is a story where I really click with Patrick Trout, and I'll put that above par of the Daleks. Um, oh, I will be ranking them within their tiers, by the way, left to right. I really love the Moon Base. I think it's a great story. Unfortunately, the Sidemen voices are now so difficult to make out, and you just want them on Dacian voices back. But the design is actually a really cool Superman design. I really enjoy that design. Not as much as the original, but it, it's good. And it's a very early type based on the Siege story, probably the first out and out based on the Siege of the Trident era, which is all about the base on the Siege stories. Um, the Sidemen are very good. Polly is also brilliant in this story. Uh, it's also, I think, that, and as I said, you know, it's the one where Trident really starts to feel like the Doctor to me. He really hasn't nailed down the performance and it's a great set and it looks like the moon um, I'll just I can just accept that in a, it's the moon and yeah it's a really good story this one I think it's got a lot of 
it's slightly underrated. I think it's sort of one of the less well-regarded Sideman stories of the Trown era, but I think that it's, it's, it's a very good story and it deserves a lot more respect. The Macro Terror, I've got the animated version of this. The animation's all right, and it probably helps the story because Lord knows how those crabs would have looked originally. But I think the Macro Terror is a nice, fun, dystopian tale, slightly creepy in a happiness patrol way with them singing all these songs about their how happy they are to basically be oppressed. And I, yeah, I, I do enjoy the Macro Terror. I think it's got, it's got a lot going for it. And yeah, I haven't really got much to say about it. I, I think Ben's very good um, as he's, I think it's one of his best performances um, from Michael Craze as he plays Ben under this hypnosis. Uh, and some of the stuff is actually quite creepy down in the tunnels with Jamie and the Macro. Again, animation might have helped that. I don't know. Usually, I would say animation could slightly hinder a story from the loss of the original. But in this case, I don't think so because the crabs that I've seen the pictures of, they look okay, but they wouldn't have been agile remotely. I don't know why I'm doing the crab thing. They wouldn't have been agile, but these ones in the animation, they are. And the animation's actually not bad. It's not among the better animations, but I think it's all right. The faceless ones is great it's the it's an amazing story i have this is the best animation in terms of the story that's been animated and the best animated animation itself a uh, very creepy story i mean just look at the face of the you probably can't see it on here but the the face of the original faceless ones is just slightly haunting i'm surprised they did it on 60s tv um kids tv as well family tv depending on what side of that argument you fall onto yeah, I really enjoy the faceless ones. Um, the only problem is that Ben and Polly don't get a lot to do for their exit story. But it's the beginning of Troughton and Jamie being an absolute iconic duo between the two. And we have Samantha, who's played by um, Pauline Collins, who's brilliant. And it's just a very interesting plot with lots of great twists and turns. Uh, again, I'd love to see how it originally looked because there's a lot of stuff that when I was watching the animation, I thought they'd never have the budget to do this you know, the planes and then going up to the spaceships. I think it's a very impressive story and I think it's actually slightly underrated as well. Evil of the Daleks is an absolute classic. It's the peak of David Whitaker's writing, particularly his Dalek writing. Uh, as I mentioned, I think he's the best Dalek writer and this is Triton's last um, Dalek story and it's just a full-blown masterpiece. Um, it's seven parts. It's a really weird Dalek story, and it, it's kooky and it's quirky, and it's also very dark. Da dark. There's a massive Dalek civil war at the end. Um, and the Doctor, basically, over the course of the story, though you don't realise he's doing it, reverse engineers Daleks, um, because the Daleks are trying to get some human traits, which you might think is a bit un-Dalek, but they're trying to perfect the species and taking human resilience and traits like that, which means that they've never been able to beat the humans. And the Doctor manages to instill a sense that, of questioning into them um, in a way that never feels cheap and rubbish like it does in Evolution of the Daleks, Daleks in Manhattan. Um, this is the vastly superior version of that story. And this is the, that story, what that story wanted to be. It wanted to be even the Daleks, but it wasn't anywhere near as good because the final episode of this is immense. The scale of it. The Dalek Emperor is incredible. And Victoria's father's death, Jamie just going on a full-on crazy mission around the house for the a couple of episodes. Beautiful Victorian setting that really changes up the pace. I really love this one. I think it's a it's a, an absolute gem of a story. And I'm really looking forward to the animation. Of all the animations we're getting, this is the one that I'm looking forward to the most. I think it's gonna be an incredible, incredible animation. I really hope that they get the people who did the faceless ones to do it because I didn't like the animated style on Fury from the Deep. It was too stagnant. Tomb of the Cybermen is great. I'll put it above the faceless ones. Yeah, probably. Um, I'm not going to say overrated because I know, I know a lot of people have an absolute classic, but just because I don't doesn't mean I think it's overrated. Um, mixes things of mummies and Egypt, ancient Egypt with um, the Cybermen and with Doctor Who. The Cybermen... Again, they still have these voices which are slightly difficult to make out, but the imagery is so iconic. The music, the musical score from Dudley Simpson this, for the Cybermen's theme is incredible and I absolutely love it. Those scenes of them breaking out of the tombs. There's a great guest cast. All the shots of them in the ice. This is just, 
it feels slightly it's like low budget but incredible looking and the whole way through and it has some amazing character moments as well i love um jamie and the doctor going to take victoria's hand and both taking each other's hand and i love the scene between victoria and the second doctor i think it's one of the best of the entire era both for the character of the second doctor and for victoria um and it's a beautiful moment um beautifully played by both of those actors and the classic who very rarely slowed down to give a really beautiful poignant moment it uh, didn't really i'm not saying it wasn't bothered about characters but not in the same way that knew who would be but it's just a really gorgeous moment the abominable snowmen great or good i'll put it in good but at the very best of this it could push into great honestly of all the totally um missing episodes nothing held my interest like this six parts atmospheric holy it was real it's brilliant and the yeti somehow work i mean maybe the loss of the visual what you could argue the loss of the actual visual of the yeti helps but i don't think so because the yeti look incredible and web of fear um you get th these warrior monks you get the society uh, of religious monks corrupted by this ancient uh, evil entity the great intelligence is brilliant there's a beautiful set in the himalayas um it's just a great story i really enjoy this one and six parts um all missing you're just looking at recons the whole time that could that could be a daunting prospect i think it was a daunting prospect and the whole way through i was just going you know what this is really good this is not like sitting they've been sitting through space pirates or something where you just say oh kill me now this is top notch I mean, you know what, talking about it, I'm just going to put it in great. I think it deserves it. It's very, very good. The Ice Warriors is okay. I'm a big Season 5 fan, so a lot of Season 5 is going to get a good review, but Ice Warriors is just okay. I like Peter Salas. I like the Ice Warriors themselves. I think Victoria's done a little bit of a disservice for parts of it. But it's a, it's a fairly solid story, although six parts, it sort of drags its heels a little bit. The Enemy of the World, however, is six parts and immaculately paced. Uh, I put it above the abominable snowmen. I love the Enemy of the World. In fact, I put it above the faces ones as well. It's a brilliant story. Triton gets to play his heart out as this doppelganger, as Salamander. It's a very intriguing tale full of all these twists and turns that really catches your attention. It looks great. I know they lifted some of the effects, um, but it looks brilliant. There's helicopters. There's a brilliant ending where the two tritons meet face to face and then salamander ends up getting sucked out of the tardis and all these interesting twists and turns and it's set in the year 2018 which just makes it interesting to see how how far they thought society would have got at this point the world government well not quite um we didn't quite made that the web of fear is the best triton story i love the web of fear it is just dripping with atmosphere this is the biggest argument against colorization. I know some people have like tried to colorize bits of episodes on YouTube channels and stuff, and I appreciate that. It's nice to see what things look like in color, but never colorize these stories because the black and white enhances something like the Web of Fear so much. Apparently, they actually asked um, the city of London if they could use the London Underground to shoot in, and they, they told them they weren't allowed to use it. So they built the sets. And they, the sets looked so good that the city of London went to the BBC and were like, we told you not to film there. And that the sets, they look that good. They stand up today. The Yeti look incredible. This is the great intelligence. There's just this paranoia plot where all these different characters, uh, and you're not sure which one's the bad guy, which, which, which one's betraying us. Um, and there's, we've got all, all the version of Travers. We've got Travers' daughter. We've got the Brigadier for the first time. We've got um, this reporter, we've got the Welsh guy, we've got um, the sergeant. It's just a great ensemble of cast and there's a music just enhances it so much. It's such a creepy tone and yet there's a bombastic sort of 1920s movie thing going on with it. I, I, I love The Web of Fear. I think it's an amazing story and it's rightly regarded as a classic. Um, and between this and the invasion, you can understand why they went for this unit format. This this format really works for this show because, man, it's great to just watch. This is the first time where we just get soldiers going at, at hammer and tong with uh, a bunch of aliens. In this case, Yeti. Um, and apparently John Levine was one that played one of the Yeti, which is just a, a nice little 
um, fact there. Fury from the Deep. It should be the end of season five. Unfortunately, Wheel in Space kind of ruins it at the end. Fury from the Deep, I'll put in good. I think it's all right. The animation didn't impress me. It really kind of felt stagnant. I got it on the cheap from HMV because they incorrectly labeled it. So there's good points for that. But yeah, I find the Fury from the Deep slightly overrated. I know there's a part of the fandom that thinks it's like the greatest story ever. Um, and the seaweed and all is cool. And I think it does some good stuff with Victoria. And her exit is very poignant and very well handled. I don't know. It just didn't thrill me. I thought it was good, but not the classic that some people seem to say. And I think sometimes that can harm stories when people amp things up as this cl as a classic story. And then when you watch it and you're just like, that's okay. But because of the hype, I was sort of expecting more. And I think that might be part of the case with Fury from the Deep. I'll be interested to rewatch it when I get around to it. Because, because I think it was a good story um, and it had a decent cast. And I've seen some of the clips from the original episode and they look really scary. The guy with his mouth open. Yikes. I know, Doctor Who can make anything scary. A guy with his mouth open. Amazing. The Wheel in Space. Ru and also, not ruined season five, but in the same way when I was talking about Hartnell and I mentioned... Uh, season two and how great a season that was and how amazing a season that was but the web planet is a little blotch on its record and the same thing goes here the wheel in space is a blotch on the record of season five which i do think is the best season of the 60s even in its incredibly formulaic format the wheel in space is just bad i mean the first episode is quite good they're on this little adventure and they're just looking around but then it just turns into i think They've worn out the base under siege with Cybermen at this point. It's like the Cybermen are back again. There's a wheel, there's a, as I was about to say, there's a wheel in space. That's a bit obvious. There's a base under siege again. The only thing keeping it out of terrible is that first episode, which is very adventure based and quite good. And Zoe Harriet, who is amazing. I love Zoe as a companion. She gets on brilliantly with everyone. Um, the Cybermats, though, they are not good. They are not good. Um, the Dominators, do you know what? Here's your second unpopular opinion for the video. The Dominators is okay. I quite I quite enjoyed it actually. It's four parts, um, so it's quite slight, it's quite silly, and the Dominators are basically just bullies, not in a Nazi sense, but just in a playground bullies kind of sense, which is interesting. But it's just a kid's show. You can have allegories for much simpler ideas, I suppose. The quarks are actually quite charming in a weird 60s way but I'll never understand why the Doctor cited them as one of the villains when the war games, when he's defending himself to the Time Lords. And he's like, and the evil quarks. I was like, let's, let's, not, let's not go there. Why don't we just talk about, I don't know, the Yeti or the Faceless Ones or the Macra. Um, I, I do enjoy the Dominators though in a, in a weird camp. I can tell it's rubbish. When I'm watching that, I know this is not good, but I still enjoy it in a weird kind of way. You know, that, that time monster kind of way where you can tell something's rubbish, but you still enjoy it regardless. The Mind Robber, absolute classic. I adore this story. When I did my, um, for Doctor Who Day last year, I watched a story from each Doctor. The Mind Robber was the second Doctor one I went for, even though it's not my favorite. Um, I would prefer The Web of Fear. I just love The Mind Robber. It's so creative, it's so imaginative, it's so inventive. The first episode had a budget of zero pounds. They just picked some sets, they just picked some costumes that they had, and they created one of the best episodes ever in just this very creepy, unsettling manner. The cliffhanger at the end of part one is insane. I love it. And then we get trapped into the land of fiction. There's just so many genius ideas. You know, we've got Gulliver, but he can only speak in the in the lines written for him by his author. And we've got, um, what have we got? we've got Rapunzel. And, you know, Jamie's just climbing uh, a cliff and he's like I could do some rope and then it's, he gets a rope and he climbs up and, and it's attached to a woman's head you know and the fan fiction battle at the end is just immense with the doctor and the master but not the actual master um both uh both just writing their fictional battle to fight against each other with pure um creative storytelling and we get Lancelot and we get D'Artagnan and we get um, Blackbeard, it's just, it's brilliant. It's, it's, it's genuinely incredible. And we get like weird things like the comic book character and this, it looks insane. It looks incredible. Like all the sets look brilliant. And there's things like the stop motion 
um, snakes on Medusa's head and there's the unicorn running. It's just a story that's like, has so much creative, no creative boundaries. It's limitless. It's like, we, Fraser Hines is ill. What are we going to do? Well, in a normal story, we would just split up the cast and Jamie would just not be in this episode or someone would get, he'd get hit on the head and he'd sleep through the episode. What they do here, they have him turned into cardboard and the Doctor reassembles his face incorrectly and then they recast him for an episode. That's the level of just bonkers, beautifully bonkers storytelling that this is at. And I adore this story. It is immense. The Invasion, the back to back classics between the Mind Robber and the Invasion. Eight parts, doesn't drag, brilliantly paced. The Cybermen turn up at the end of part four and it's their best entry. Better than Mondas, better than Telos, better than their turning up in the wheel in space. That burst on out, Cybermen who bursts out there is brilliant. Some of the, the imagery is so iconic. The Cybermen at St. Paul's Cathedral, the Cyberman who's just gone totally insane down in the sewers. Um, it's the first time we meet Benton. It's the establishment of a unit. Uh, Colonel Lethbridge Stewart is now Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, um, who is who's the one heading up unit. Um, uh, there's Vaughn, there's Packer. Uh, Isabel Watkins is brilliant, possibly the best classic companion that we never had. Just as a one-off character we had for one episode, absolutely brilliant. All the characters are just incredibly well-defined from their very first moments. Um, Vaughn's plan is just mental. He just sort of skates on thin ice for like eight episodes and then sort of gets his own back um, on the Cybermen and then only to be killed. He just sides with the highest bidder, basically, for whoever can uh, help him out the most. It's very futuristic and it's slightly scary and it's not solved in a typical we're going to be all clever way. It's solved by Zoe programming a missile plan and blowing up their spaceships, which is just so so unusual but it's this new militarized format and the web of fear and the invasion are my two favorite trent stories and they are the unit stories and i think that shows how good a formula for doctor who the unit format was and that's why they took it into the poetry era which is by the way my favorite era so maybe that's why i love those two unit stories so much but top-notch stuff genuinely incredible next the crotons uh Robert Holmes did not have a good run with Trout, and he's the best classic writer, without a doubt for me, but he did not have a good run with Trout, and both his stories are going to be propping up the rest of this list. I don't like the Crotons. It's bland, it's dull. The Crotons themselves look stupid. It feels very basic and generic. There's some nice stuff between Zoe and the Doctor, but that's not redeeming it, because it's just so weak. Seeds of Death, this is my actual popular opinion for the video. This one gets a lot of love, and a lot of people seem to think that it's like the greatest Ice War story, but I think it's bad. Out and out bad. I mean, it's not a grievous, it's not, but it's it's drags, it's a lot about trans mats. There's a lot of stuff that I'm just like not there for. Maybe I was just impatient to get to the war games when I was watching this, but I've seen this. This is in a box set, a visitations box set with Carnival of Monsters in the Talons of Wen Chiang, which are two of my favourite stories ever. And this one's put in there. And I'm like, how is that seen in the same league as that? But I, I've read a lot of comments. I've seen a lot of YouTube reactors who really love The Seeds of Death and cite it as one of their favourite Chiang stories. And they just say, I'll just say that they see something that I don't because I really didn't get on board with this. But I got on board with it a lot more. In fact, I would have enjoyed Seeds of Death so much more if I'd known that I was going to have to sit through six parts of the Space Pirates. Now, I've seen people defending this recently um, on Twitter and stuff. And fine enough, if you like it, then that's your gig. But man alive, it's dull. Dull as dishwater. Robert Holmes, again, he did not have a good start, did he? I know this was all hampered by behind the scenes stuff. But it's so boring. It's just so boring. Space Pirates. That is a fun title. That is a title you should be able to go mad with. And it's just so dull. There's just two, this is like a bunch of factions. Fight. I can't even remember. I zoned out for so much of it. Six parts, none of them actually there, or maybe one of them's there, but most of it you're just watching recons, which doesn't help whatsoever. It just comes off as bland, unfortunately. And, uh, yeah, 
it's not terrible in a web planet makes me angry this is such an awful thing why did they put it on tv kind of way but just in a this is so boring why would you even bother with this kind of way and it's six parts and they just drag it out because everyone is focused on the war games and honestly the war games could go an absolute classic but it maybe is a little bit too long but i'll put it in great it's an amazing story i love the war games 10 parts it should feel like a drag and yes there's a bit too much cat and mouse getting captured getting recaptured escaping but it's brilliant it's an amazing concept for a story you know all these time zones where you're just crossing through the mist and then suddenly you're in a totally different time zone but then they're not really anywhere because they're sort of in this not a mini scope but a sort of i don't know where they are exactly they're on a planet somewhere um, and the war chiefs are keeping an eye on them um the war chief and the warlord are brilliant villains um the whole thing is well paced jamie and so we both get great things to do there's the military, there's all these uh, brilliant group of characters from Lady Jennifer to that guy whose name I can't remember, but he's great. The guy in World War One who they meet. There's just so many interesting ideas. And then it starts off simple and you think you're just in a World War One story and then it gets mental by the end of part two. And then it just gets more progressively insane as it goes on. And then we go up to when we're in the, uh, the are they called the war people? I don't know. Um, and they've got those masks and they're processing people it's such a weird plan but a brilliant way to show the horror of war and oh, episode 10 first of all the episode 9 cliffhanger when the doctor runs away and then there's the slow motion shot of him going towards the TARDIS but episode 10 is just perfect and the the time lords have never been better they are so omnipotent and powerful and they do take the doctor seriously and it shows how far the doctors come from um, an earthly child to hear the 60s arc is perfectly completed when he gives that passionate speech about why he does what he does why he intervenes why he's changed his ways why he has gone from the guy who didn't want to get involved in an earthly child as i say let's get out of here and get to the next place to the guy who does go looking for trouble the guy who does he's still a reluctant hero but he thinks that there's some fights that you need to fight and it's a very impassioned speech and his exit with um, no, the exit of Jamie and Zoe is heartbreaking because it's it's the original Donna Noble. It's um, obviously, I know that's cart before horse, but it really is. It's the original version of that. And it's it's a very, very sad ending for both those characters who I love. Um, that's his best TARDIS team, by the way. I love Victoria, but Zoe and Jamie with the second Doctor, that's the perfect TARDIS team. I, it's, a very, it's a heartbreaking end for them, getting all their character development shunned zoe learning to be more like a normal human being rather than the incredibly intelligent but socially inept person that we met in uh the original wheel in space and jamie just going back to hating english people like he did in the highlanders and not really understanding the nuances which is a real shame but it's a beautiful ending and then they do the thing they exile to earth and they change his face and it's a brilliant and perfect end for the doctor whose entire thing was running he just ran away from everything that he finally can't run anymore he's finally met the people who he cannot run away from dalek cybermen easy his own people can't do anything about that and the time lords are just incredible it's a brilliant story the war games immense so just looking at that list, there's more bad than there was in the Heart and Lyra, but there's also far more up the very top end than there was then. I think it's a phenomenal Lyra. It drags a bit at the end because season six is not quite so good. But honestly, this is a brilliant era. And I would say it deserves a lot more love, but everyone knows that. Everyone accepts that the Trouton era is great. Um, but please tell me your thoughts in the comments down below. I would be very interested to hear what you've got to say about Patrick Troughton and about his era and you know about these different characters who's the best companions and why it's obviously Jamie because it is obviously